On September 7, 1860, a severe thunderstorm over Lake Michigan produced torrential rains and gale force winds that resulted in almost zero visibility. This thunderstorm, a schooner carrying lumber, and a luxury passenger carrying over 400 passengers combined to create the greatest loss of life in the history of the Great Lakes. This is the story of the Lady Elgin. The Great Lakes are the largest group of freshwater lakes on Earth by area and the second largest by total volume. They are large freshwater lakes that are so massive that they present sea-like characteristics. These vast lakes are home to terrible storms producing gale force winds and waves comparable to the worst sea conditions on Earth. These conditions have historically wreaked havoc on vessels that have used the Great Lakes to travel between cities on the coasts. The Great Lakes also connect to the Atlantic Ocean by way of the St. Lawrence River. So not only are the cities on the coasts of the Great Lakes connected by the lakes, they also provide passage to the Atlantic. Water flows from inland rivers feeding the lakes from Superior to Huron and Michigan, southward to Erie, and then north to Ontario, then on to the Atlantic by the St. Lawrence River. Throughout the history of the Great Lakes, there have been many disasters and mysteries that have occurred, including ship sinking and disappearances, including the famous Edmund Fitzgerald and the disappearance of Flight 2501. Many of these tragic events have occurred at a location named the Bermuda Triangle of the Great Lakes, named after the Bermuda Triangle where many accidents and disappearances have occurred over the years. The Bermuda Triangle of the Great Lakes is located on Lake Michigan, where the greatest tragedy in the Great Lakes history took place on September 7, 1860. The Lady Elgin was a wooden-hulled, sidewheel steamship that was built in Buffalo, New York in 1851. Though the routes on the Great Lakes were mostly occupied by trade vessels at the time, the Lady Elgin was a premier luxury passenger ship. The ship was top-rated at the time, carrying passengers between Chicago, Buffalo, and Ontario, as well as other Lake Michigan and Lake Superior ports. The Lady Elgin was no stranger to accidents. The ship sank in 1854 after striking a rock, but was recovered and repaired. The ship also caught on fire in 1858, struck two separate reefs in 1858, and had to be towed back to shore twice in 1859 after breaking her crossbeam and after breaking a crank pin. But the disaster in 1860 would be called one of the greatest maritime horrors on record, and at the time was the greatest loss of life on the Great Lakes. On September 6, 1860, the Lady Elgin left Milwaukee, Wisconsin en route to Chicago, Illinois. The luxury ship was chartered by members of Milwaukee's Union Guard. Milwaukee's Irish Union Guard were on a fundraising mission to Chicago. Milwaukee's Union Guard was made almost entirely of the Irish political community of Milwaukee. Wisconsin was quickly becoming an abolitionist state, meaning that they wanted to abolish slavery in the United States and would represent the North in the upcoming and foreseeable civil war lurking on the horizon. The Milwaukee Union Guard saw this as traitorous and supported the southern states. Obviously, because the Wisconsin governor did not want a pro-Confederate armed militia residing in what would become a free state, the Milwaukee Union Guard was unceremoniously disarmed. So, they chartered the Lady Elgin to go to Chicago on a fundraising trip where Stephen Douglas was set to give a speech on September 7th. Stephen Douglas was set to run against Abraham Lincoln in the upcoming presidential election. The Milwaukee Guard was using this opportunity of Stephen Douglas' speech to show up and meet people of similar thinking, and to hopefully raise money so they could arm themselves. The Milwaukee Guard showed up in Chicago on the 7th and spent the day listening to political speeches, partying, and accepting donations from supporters of Stephen Douglas. They accepted donations, but also sold hundreds of fundraising tickets for people to ride the Lady Elgin with them back to Wisconsin. Not only did many people join the militia on the return trip, but there were also people simply traveling from Chicago to Milwaukee. There were also approximately 60 head of cattle and a farm boy to look after them in the ship's hold. 
At the end of the day, the few unpurchased tickets that were left were handed out for free to anyone that wanted to join the trip. When it was all said and done, the exact headcount was unknown, but it was estimated that there were well more than 400 people aboard the Lady Elgin. When the ship departed just before midnight, the patrons had been drinking and partying most of the day. The party briefly continued aboard the ship while a German brass band played music. The patrons listened to music and continued partying while the weather outside made a turn for the worse. It was getting late and everyone was exhausted from the long day. The passengers retreated to their bunks and the saloon patrons soon passed out on the chairs and couches in the various saloons on the ship. Soon the storm outside had turned into a severe thunderstorm, and the Lady Elgin was pushing directly into gale force winds and torrential rainfall. It was dark and rainy. The Augusta, a schooner loaded with lumber, was thrashed about by the storm. About three miles off the shore of Highland Park, at about 2.15 a.m., the crew of the Augusta spotted the Lady Elgin in the night, but quickly lost sight of the ship in the waves and heavy rain. The crew of the Augusta, fighting through the storm, determined that the Lady Elgin was headed in a different direction and was not a concern. At the same time, aboard the Lady Elgin, a porter named Edwin Westlake just laid down in his bunk for the night. He was just asleep when a loud crash jolted him awake. He ran up to the deck and forward along the starboard side and saw that a vessel had crashed into the ship. Moments before, helmsmen on both the Augusta and the Lady Elgin had spotted one another barreling towards each other. They both tried to turn away. Second mate M. W. Beeman later said, The night was intensely dark. The rain was falling in torrents, the lightning was vivid, and the thunder incessant. As the two vessels came together, the crew cried out to the Augusta. Beeman stated that the Augusta seemed to pay no attention to the Lady Elgin, but the schooner was riding low, weighted down by the lumber, and was slow to respond. When the ship did respond, the lumber on board shifted, drawing the schooner straight into the side of the ship, just forward the paddle box on the starboard side. The impact tore off the wheel and cut through the wheel guards and into the hull. The Augusta had moderate damage and in the darkness it appeared that the Lady Elgin only had minor damage. The Augusta knew that they could make it back to shore, only being a few miles off, and they also believed that the Lady Elgin could easily make it back. So the Augusta pulled away and headed back to Chicago. The Lady Elgin's captain, Jack Wilson, ordered that a boat be lowered to survey the damage. Westlake went down to check and discovered that the damage was more severe than they first suspected. Captain Wilson ordered the cattle thrown overboard to reduce the weight so the ship would ride higher in the water, raising the hull above the water level. This did not work, and water poured into the hull. Lady Elgin crew member Frederick Rice was one of the people trying to plug the hull and slow the water long enough to reach shore. He stated, Everything that could be done was done to try to stop up the hole. Mattresses were pushed into it and planks spiked over it, but to no avail. As they were trying to plug the hole, Captain Wilson ran down to the cabin to wake up the passengers and get them out onto the hurricane deck. Many of the passengers had locked their doors and passed out after the long night of drinking before. He pounded on the doors, but some of them would not awake. Captain Wilson then got an axe and began knocking down doors, yelling at the frightened passengers to get up and save themselves. The passengers fled to the hurricane deck as the ship began to break apart. Captain Wilson planned to steer the ship to the nearest shore and beach it, but the ship didn't hold up. Within 20 minutes from impact, the Lady Elgin broke apart, covering the water with debris. The hurricane deck performed as designed and provided a life raft for many of the passengers. However, hundreds of passengers ended up in the water, clinging on to debris as the storm thrashed them about. Many people got trapped and smashed between large pieces of the ship and died in the first few minutes. The ones that managed to stay above surface viewed shore as the storm carried the wreckage south to Winnetka. The hurricane deck broke into two pieces under the force of the crashing waves. Captain Wilson was ordering the people on board one of the pieces while carrying a child in his arms. Captain Wilson was crying out to watch out for the breakers just before the deck crashed into a sandbar. The deck crashed into the sandbar as they approached shore, sending all passengers into the raging waters. Some of the passengers made it to shore, 
crediting Captain Wilson with saving their lives. However, Captain Wilson was never seen again. Three lifeboats had been detached from the ship before it broke apart. The life rafts were now reaching shore, and the people were running door to door to the houses in Winnetka, getting help for anyone that could. Word spread throughout town, and many came to assist. Among them was a man named Edward Spencer, a student at the Garrett Biblical Institute on the campus of Northwestern University. The townspeople flooded down to the beach to assist in the rescue. When they arrived, the scene was tragic. The breakers were huge and covered with large debris that were smashing people as they tried to make it to shore. The drummer of the German band clung to his bass drum and rowed it to shore. Several passengers made it through the break and rowed to shore on top of an animal pin that was kept afloat by the buoyancy of dead cattle. Another man grabbed onto a plank and snagged a waiter just before he was pulled under. They made it to shore. Along with the violent breakwaters, the storm caused a forceful undertow that if the passengers came near the shore in the wrong spot, they would be swept back out into the deeper waters. Many people were swept back out after nearly reaching the shore, only to drown with land in their sights while it was impossible to reach. The student, Edward Spencer, recognized that the people were being swept out by the current. He retrieved a rope and tied it around his waist and waded out into the water. As the people were being battered by the breakers, he would throw the rope out for them to grab, then he would pull them ashore. Others on land took note and began doing the same. Edward continued to fight the crashing waves and pull people from the waters for hours until he finally collapsed from exhaustion, and his brother William carried him back to their dorm room. Upon waking the next day, Edward asked William if he had done his best. William reassured him and told Edward that he had saved 17 people's lives. Edward said, I know, but I'm afraid that I still didn't do my best. The next day, a train from Milwaukee arrived carrying relatives and friends of lost passengers from the Lady Elgin. The families of the lost waited at the shore watching each breaker as the lake carried in dead bodies. Although the exact number of deaths is not known, the count was well above 300 lives lost. Bodies washed up all across the shores of Lake Michigan over the next several weeks. Most of the dead were from Milwaukee, with most of these from the Irish communities, including nearly all of Milwaukee's Irish Union Guard. So many of Milwaukee's Irish political community died that day that it was said that the balance of political power in Milwaukee shifted from the Irish to the Germans. Edward Spencer was physically and emotionally scarred by these events. He did not return to the Divinity School. Instead, he moved to California and worked on a farm. He passed away in 1917 with his brother drafting a summary of Edward's life in the pamphlet entitled, He Did His Best. After the tragedy, Davis Malott, the captain of the Augusta, was arrested and tried for navigational negligence, but found not guilty as his second mate, Mr. Budge, and his crew were found to be incompetent. The not guilty verdict was found because the law gave sailing vessels the right of way over steamships and also sailing vessels were not required to have running lights. It was stated at the time that the entire tragedy could have been averted if the Augusta had a $15 lantern on board. In 1864, the law was changed requiring running lights on all sailing vessels. This is True Mysteries. Please like, leave comments, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.